Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, wonderful evening to you all. Uh, this is Daniel. Sorry, my network is a bit shaky, uh, but that's my passport. Uh, welcome, uh, Candice and uh, Oluchi, to the session. I'm really uh, glad that you are able to join us. Sorry, um, I was experiencing some network challenge before. I wasn't able to uh, speak, but I hope now I'm audible. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, thank okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It's a great pleasure. And we are really uh, looking forward to learning from you. I have read a lot about your work and I also seen some of the uh, videos that you, you did quite a while back. And it's really uh, great to see the good work that you're doing. So I'll start us off by just uh, maybe sharing a bit. Uh, about each one of you, then I think uh, you can take over from there. And hopefully we'll have more people join us as we continue so that we save on time. So thank you so much, Ibron, who has made it to the session. And thank you so much for joining on time. So I'll introduce our guest speakers. Then I think they'll take us from there. And we'll also have a poll. I have it from mine, so I'll just project it. Then hopefully um, uh, there are the questions that you've shared. So I'll just try and project it. And then after I read your my intros, and then I think uh, we'll start off with the poll. So thank you, everyone. So I'll introduce our guest, and I'll start with Candice. Uh, Candice uh, on a concert, sorry if I spell it wrongly. So she's a researcher in the Division of Infectious Diseases and HIV and Medicine at the University of Cape Town, that is UCT in South Africa. and. Um, Prior to this, she worked as a clinical nurse in a pediatric setting, followed by a research position with Child Nurse Practice Development Initiative, the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health. And recently, she completed work on the ASPIRE study, that's antibiotic use across surgical pathways, investigating, redesigning, and evaluating system, which was conducted at Groot School Hospital, which is in Cape Town. And this was a multi-site multi study, which aimed to investigate the cultural norms, established hierarchies, team roles and methods of communication around antibiotic stewardship, the infection prevention and control which operates within the surgical pathway. And she's also doing a PhD, which focuses on applying novel qualitative approaches to study communications and its impact on team dynamics in relation to infection-related decision-making. In addition to traditional qualitative methods, she's using and developing visual methods to make visible the practice of everyday doing in clinical settings. She has a keen interest in understanding the nurse role in AMR within the context of the wider multidisciplinary team. And she's a registered nurse with a master's in nursing from the University of Cape Town. So thank you so much, uh, Candice. It's really a great uh, work that you're doing and also looking at it from a very a novel approach. I think we haven't had so much studies that really focus on this other side of antibiotic stewardship, which I think it's very, uh, very essential too. And over now to Dr. Oluchi Mbamalu, who is a research pharmacist at the Division of Infectious Diseases and HIV Medicine at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And she has experience in academia and pharmacy practice, as well as in mixed methods and field laboratory research. Her current research interests explore barriers to diagnostic, diagnostic uptake to address EMR, the pharmacist's role in stewardship and infection care and drug shortage effect on EMR. So following her participation as a researcher in the multi-site aspire study, she's currently the lead investigator on the NRF-funded post-PhD research, which explores opportunities for patient and wider stakeholder engagement for infection care. So thanks so much. And also I'm happy to hear at least there's also the role of the patient, which is also coming out, which hasn't really been uh, looked at mostly before. So I'll try and share the poll then I think uh, we'll just, so there are not many questions. Um, so the first one we'll just, I know you have shared some of our responses via chat, but it's good we also capture it as we will just type the country that you're joining us from, your cause or area of profession, and then just a few questions about AMS so that at least uh, we're able to document it. So I'm launching it at the moment. You can just confirm whether you'll be able to see it. Uh, is the poll visible? Are you able to see?
Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So we can just take uh, roughly three minutes. We just uh, are feeling quickly. So there are just six questions. So good progress. Um, so eight of us have completed. Let's just continue typing in. Uh, thank you. For those who are joining us, it's okay, I think you won't be able to see the poll if you join the table's launch. So I think uh, we'll then share the questions with you afterwards. Yeah. So thank you guys. Let's uh, try and uh, fast enough a bit so that at least we're able to save on time. Thank you. Daniel, I'm sorry, we're having an issue here with just getting our slideshow to move on. Um, I'm, I'm, sorry? No, I say we're just having a problem with getting our, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So our computer just froze there for a second. Um, oh, it's okay. Daniel, are you good if we, if we start? Um, yeah, let's just. If one more minute, at okay. least we yeah, one more minute. Right. Uh, for those who had to, uh, so that then I'll end the poll. Maybe just project the results just shortly, then we can start. So guys, one more minute. Uh, <laughs>
Okay, sorry, I thought it had a, a time out like the breakout room, but let me just share the results. Uh, just a minute. Uh, okay, is it visible? We're seeing the rest. Daniel, but not the specifics. So we've seen how many people have answered, but not what the answers are. Okay, okay, okay. Let me work on it, then maybe I can share afterwards uh, as the presentation goes on. Thank right. you so much, and over to you, Oluchi and Andy. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I think it's quite warming to see um, such interest in stewardship. And especially after hours, we weren't sure if we we're going to get <laughs> a lot of people attending because it's after hours. And we are so happy to see that you all um, you all made time to join us today. And so if you are all interested in stewardship, I'm not sure if we have um, a lot then to teach you on stewardship, but there is always, of course, room to learn. And even as we are presenting, we also want to learn from you. And we want this session to be interactive. So if you do have any questions and you don't think it will wait till the end, please feel free to, um, to jump in and ask a question. And that can also help us with the direction of our presentation. And I love the topic, which is how um, harnessing multidisciplinary engagement, because it seems we need such multidisciplinary engagement for antimicrobial stewardship. And in a lot of places, we have stewardship progressing, but our research has also shown us that over time, not just over time, but generally we do need like more people involved in stewardship. And there are some people whose roles are not really so clear for everyone to see. Sorry, wait, wait. Just a moment, let's <laughs> Okay, so we're trying to get to our next screen. Yes. So Candice and I have been involved in the ASPIRE study. Um, some of you might have attended some of the courses we had um, sometime in the past, um, a MOOC course on the Future Learn platform. And on the ASPIRE study, we have had to do some um, qualitative research related to antimicrobial stewardship, not necessarily the clinical part of it, but observing people who are involved in stewardship, and then looking at it from, more from a research point of view. And the ASPIRE study was meant to optimize antibiotic use across surgical pathways. It was funded by the Economic and Social um, Research Council and was conducted across three countries, India, the UK, and South Africa. And our workplace in South Africa, Rutes Kiawa Hospital, was one of the study sites. And so this is where we study, this is where we conduct research, and this is where we try to work on um, stewardship and stewardship um, principles, not necessarily in the clinical setting, but also from a research um, perspective and also looking at qualitative research and what social science can tell us about why people prescribe or how people prescribe the way they do and why patients use um, antimicrobials the way they do and what we can learn from the interactions then between patients and the healthcare workers or between healthcare workers themselves. And so Reuters Care Hospital is a 950 bed uh, institution. It's a public hospital and also a referral um, center, an academic training center for students who are in the health sciences um, for their practical work, not only in stewardship, but in many other clinical um, procedures. And we're quite lucky to have um, antimicrobial stewardship program, which is um, one of the examples that are referred to in many settings. And we've got different um, team members and different components and different departments involved in stewardship in our setting. Sorry. Okay, in stewardship in our settings, sorry, we just want to switch that up. And so for our talk, we're going to follow the, we're going to give our talk according to these outlines. We introduce stewardship and then give some narratives on antimicrobial stewardship. And then we touch briefly on the importance of multidisciplinary engagement in stewardship and one or two success stories that we um, think will give us great um, insight and great ideas also for learning. And of course, there will be question and, um, question and discussion at the end, but please feel free to come in um, with any questions you have at any time. And so when we look at or try to define stewardship, we have the, we have a um, 
signpost definition, which is from the World Health Organization. And um, this is for the, um, for the toolkit that they developed for stewardship in middle income countries. And the, it was necessary to develop one for middle income countries, lower middle income countries, because the resources are not necessarily the same as you have in high income settings. And so sometimes some contextual factors might affect the way stewardship is carried out in different settings. And so this really speaks to the resource limitations that are present in some low and middle income countries and how these can be harnessed and properly utilized for effective stewardship. And so antimicrobial stewardship then refers to a set of actions which promote the responsible use of antimicrobials. So any action that is designed to promote responsible antibiotic use can be classified as um, antimicrobial stewardship. And antimicrobial stewardship can take place at the global level um, across um, animal health um, facilities, even um, among individuals and patients who are in hospitals or in non-hospital settings and in the environment as well. And different people can get involved in stewardship. Um, the most, uh, one of the most um, important referrals for stewardship is the document from the CDC, which is on the core elements of stewardship programs. And this is more for hospital antibiotic stewardship programs. And there are a number of elements that have to be available and present for successful stewardship in various settings. Some, um, some studies have also looked at assessing these um, elements in different hospitals to know the level of support that stewardship enjoys in such hospitals. But then stewardship from what we are presenting today involves different stakeholders and doesn't only take place in hospital settings. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about stewardship in other different settings and how, how we have different views and different lens and how stewardship can be implemented in different places, even with um, resource limitations. And why do we do antimicrobial stewardship? Why, do we, why are we interested in it? Um, currently, we have limited supply of new antimicrobials for any new infections that might develop that would not have any um, potential antibiotic to treat with. But even if we do have these new antimicrobials, developing resistance is a normal natural mechanism of microorganisms. And so even if we do have new antimicrobials developed, it's just a matter of time and the microbes will find a way around it and find a way to develop resistance to it. And when we do have such a situation, it's going to be quite dire because if we run out of antibiotics to treat infections, then even simple infections or even um, surgery, routine surgeries cannot then be conducted because antibiotics that will be used in such procedures will not be available. I think if we look at COVID, we can get an insight into what might be happening in a few years if we do not control antimicrobial resistance. And so COVID hit, and we had no uh, vaccines available. We had no treatment options available. And people had, we had to have lockdowns across different parts of the world because nobody was sure of what treatment was actually correct or what was quite right to be used for COVID. And this is something um, we don't, I'm not going to details with COVID now, but in a few years time, if we do not control antimicrobial resistance, we can get to the point where people are getting infections that are all resistant and there is no antimicrobial to treat such infections. And then these resistant infections can be transferred from one person to another. And so we will have people then who are sick, who are ill, and there will be no, there will be no um, solutions or there will be limited solutions because we've run out of antimicrobials to treat them with. And every exposure to an antimicrobial agent has this potential to result in resistance, which is why we need to use the ones we have judicious. So if someone doesn't need an exposure to an antimicrobial agent, then we don't have to give it to the person. And when we do have to give one to a particular person, then we have to make sure we give the right one, um, you know, the right dose and at the right time. And this is all part of what stewardship training is also about. So it's very good to see that there are students who are also involved because you are the ones who are the future. You are the ones who are going to take this forward. And so if you have this in mind, every time you have to prescribe or treat or recommend antimicrobials to someone, it will help us to, to avoid the irresponsible use of antimicrobials and the attendant um, resistance that might develop with it. And so stewardship takes place in different settings. In some of these settings, they are similar. In some other settings, they are more or less the same. Um, we conducted a study about this. Um, like we, in the MOOC study we did a few years ago, we wrote up the um, outcomes from that, which tells us a bit more about how stewardship looks in different settings. And I think, um, Candice, I don't know if you want to tell us more about um, the MOOC study and the findings um, from that case. 
Very happy to report on that. Thank you so much, Guluchi. So um, as Guluchi said, um, stewardship is implemented in, in different countries and it really does look different across the globe. And this is predominantly because of the contextual differences um, that we have. So we used a MOOC, um, which is a massive online course, um, as a platform to gather some narratives in terms of what stewardship implementation looks like across the globe. So in 2019, there was a, a, a very good um, a, a, a MOOC course that was run called Tackling Antimicrobial Resistance, a Social Science um, Approach, which we're going to tell you about later. It's a free online course that you can currently do. And basically what we did was we, we gathered responses from, um, from people who participated in this course. It was a three-week course. And throughout the, the presentations, the presenters gave participants an opportunity to engage um, what stewardship was like and what they were experiencing in their practice throughout the MOOC course. We took those and we analyzed them and um, we came up with some quite interesting findings. But just to tell you a little bit about the participants, we had just, over, just under 1,500 learners from 114 countries and just just over half of those were from high income countries. So it really does show that we had quite good representation um, from across the globe. Um, most of the participants, I think because of the subject were, were healthcare professionals and then students from, from different backgrounds or different um, specialties. So as I talk through some of the findings here, like, and I think as we talk through this whole presentation, I think it's really important for you to locate, you know, what's meaningful to you and what does it actually look like in your workplace, in, in the place that you're studying? Um, what does it look like with your, with, your, um, with your colleagues, whether you are already in multidisciplinary teams? But some of what came through from what people were saying is that, um, a lot of the places said that they don't actually have stewardship programs. I don't know what your response would be on that. Um, then some respondents said that they do have stewardship guidelines. Um, and then other places said they've got guidelines, but the, the guidelines are not being implemented. Um, so I just wonder, like in your workplace, where do you know where your guidelines are? Do you know where those stewardship guidelines are and actually what they say? Um, and then across the, the board, the composition of, of stewardship activities and also stewardship teams varied. Um, so we were, um, with Ulichi being a pharmacist and, and me being a nurse, we were really interested to see that, that the, um, there were consistent themes around um, the roles of nurses and pharmacists, as well as challenges, and that um, they're not well defined at the moment. I don't know if you find that in your context as well. And so this is what some of the pharmacists, uh, some of the participants were saying related to the roles and challenges for pharmacists and nurses. Now, I don't want to rush through this and I don't want to focus on the ones that I'm interested in, but I'm just going to give you a few seconds um, to just have a look through these responses. And again, um, think about what your response would be and do you recognize some of what you're seeing on the screen? So I found with, with the nurses is that um, I was quite surprised at the sort of the limited description in terms of what nurses' roles in stewardship are. Um, and then again, that, you know, with pharmacists, that there are challenges around lack of training um, and knowledge on antimicrobials and AMR. And then with nurses, the challenge is that, yes, there is a nurse, uh, nurse role in AMR, but um, it's not well defined and it's not being seen in policies and procedures. So just moving on from that paper, um, we, we also had um, a section which reported on the challenges and limitations to stewardship. I don't want to go into the details of what we found, but I think what I want to illustrate to you is what is required for stewardship. So everything under the umbrella is are the different components that we need to think about um, when we think about antimicrobial stewardship. So on the one hand, in terms of the system, we're needing governance, we're needing policy, we're needing leadership. And then there's the whole um, antibiotic prescribing and whether we have guidelines, um, whether those guidelines are accessible, whether they're appropriate. And then do we have access to antibiotics? 
and then the importance of monitoring and surveillance. Um, but on the other side, so we've got the system on the one side, and then on the other side is that real human dynamic, the challenge um, that we have within our teams and issues like hierarchies um, playing a really big role in terms of whose voice is heard, um, in terms of who is able to prescribe antibiotics. So just, um, I would like to show you this so that you can think about um, what are these components looking like in your context and what are some of the challenges that you might have in the system-wide challenges as well as the, um, as well as the team challenges. So I'm just going to bring this part to an end, and I'm really um, I'm glad to be handing over to Uluchi now, who's going to be talking a little bit about the importance of um, multidisciplinary engagement in stewardship. Thank you, Uluchi. Thank you, Candice. And so in stewardship, we have um, the question, um, who do we involve in stewardship? Um, in some places, it is only the doctors um, and the pharmacists who are involved in stewardship. In some other settings, you have infectious disease doctors who are actually um, very interested and engaged in stewardship, and you don't have a lot of other people involved. But one of the limitations of stewardship, especially in low and middle income countries, is that some there are not some um, specific designated roles for specific uh, people to get involved in stewardship. And so many of those who do it then do it in addition to their own normal job description. And so it takes also time and it's, you then find those who are very passionate about stewardship. And these are the ones then who get engaged in stewardship. But then we have room for doctors, for nurses, for pharmacists, for um, microbiologists, for um, anesthetists even, in some settings, they are the ones who, um, who um, decide and take on the role of antimicrobial administration before surgery. And of course, you have surgeons. And there has been a case made for surgeon involvement in stewardship as well. But even um, away from the multidisciplinary team, we also have some other multidisciplinary stakeholders. And in this, we are looking at patients and the public. And when we look at patients and the public, we see them being engaged also by different people. So we have pharmacists here, which might be a bias because it's not only pharmacists who engage patients. Um, we also have nurses who stay at the patient's bedside most of the time, especially in hospitals. And so we have nurses involved, um, or there is room then to involve nurses in stewardship. Of course, we have the clinicians who are the doctors and the surgeons and the other people who make, um, who make the diagnostic um, decisions on of patient care. And of course, we have different possibilities for engaging patients in antimicrobial stewardship. So we look at, I just wanted to look at this using the five questions from Clarify Health on the possibilities for engaging the patient in antimicrobial stewardship. And when we look at the patient, we're also looking at the patient as a part of the public population because our patient was our part of the public population before they became a patient actually. And so who do we call a patient? So a patient then is um, somebody who's in um, previous definitions said a patient or somebody receiving care in a hospital setting. But over time, I think that definition has actually been broadened because now care is not only received in hospital settings. If we look at patients who go to a patent medicine dealer or to a community pharmacy to get, um, to get some medicines if they're feeling ill, if we look at the traditional description, then that excludes them. Whereas we know that these people are patients also. There has also been some, some um, discussion about the word patient and where it comes from and that it connotes um, bearing and suffering. And so some people don't want to be called patients. I would prefer to be called maybe consumers or stakeholders or some other term. But then who is an antimicrobial resistant patient? And how do patients get involved in AMR? And so an AMR patient is somebody who has an antimicrobial resistant infection. And patients generally do not get involved of their own free will. Some do, but in many cases, patients only get involved in antimicrobial stewardship when they encounter an antimicrobial resistant infection. And for many patients, that is the first time they, you know, they sit and think about it. That's the first time they try to understand what it's all about. That's the first time they try to engage in it. And so for many, it's made them be like a shock and for them, it's not very easy to come to terms with what it is, especially if then it has very um, devastating consequences. For some, they still get over the infection and get better. But then we also know about people who have got resistant infections and did not get better. And so many patients some public members who get involved in stewardship do this because somebody they know or they themselves have been exposed to um, resistant infections. 
And bearing in mind that patients are the ones who are then, who are, who are the, what word do I use? Who are the subjects of resistant infections? We need to know then what the patient has to do to prevent antimicrobial resistant infection. But research has shown that there is very, very poor knowledge also among patients in the knowledge of antimicrobial resistance. So that's something that we can do. We can start with education and telling patients about how to use antimicrobials judiciously. And I'm sure people have done this, have seen a lot of some publications where this was done, but it's quite challenging to do this sustainably. And so I think our work then will be to find sustainable ways of doing this and not just to have it last for the length of the research that was done, only to go back to the status quo, you know, once the research is completed. And why do we have to involve patients in antimicrobial stewardship? Well, they are the most constant members of the healthcare pathway and they're the recipients of healthcare. And so when we talk about resistant infections, these take place in patients, in patients or in, in subjects who are considered patients. And so they are the consumers of antimicrobial um, agents and they are the ones who will then show the signs of resistance. And so because it's happening, as one patient told me during an interview, it's happening to me, so <laughs> it's happening to big patients. So the patient has to be involved. And so being the constant in the healthcare pathway, this puts them in a space or in the pathway as a viable stakeholder who can actually be involved and who can contribute so much to antimicrobial um, stewardship discussions. And uh, another reason also is because the factors that actually contribute to antimicrobial resistance have been found to depend a lot on our behavior, such as how we utilize um, antimicrobials in different settings. And so because this has a lot to do on individual and community behaviors. We then have to see how we can get individuals, so patients and the public and even the community involved in how to address antimicrobial resistance. If some of this is contributed by people's behavior, then modifying such behavior becomes something we can do. And then who do we go to to do that? It's the subjects again, the human beings involved in making such um, decisions. And how do we get patients involved in antimicrobial resistance? So we conducted a scoping review um, when, two years ago, <laughs> to find out how patients can be involved in infection prevention and control and antimicrobial resistance. And using, um, using, some, um, using some standards set by um, Tatari et al., we tried to look at the literature that met our inclusion criteria and to find out how patients were involved in infection prevention and control and antimicrobial stewardship. And we found very limited involvement of patients in antimicrobial stewardship. This was from our scoping review. But from our SPIRE study also, we also picked up the same, um, the same thing. And so patients are there and they are in the pathway and they have the potential to be engaged, but not all patients are able to be part of this. And it's not because the healthcare workers do not want to engage with the patients. There are also some other patient um, related factors that stop patients from getting involved in stewardship or stop them from trying to ask questions about what they can do, or because they are scared to offend the clinicians who may not be offended by the questions, but the patients don't want to rock the boat and, and do something that might jeopardize their treatment. And so we found a lot of um, gaps in how patients can be engaged and in what patients can do. This was only for surgical patients, but can also be modified to apply to patients in other settings. And so we came up with um, a graph or a pathway or a plot to show. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm sorry for interrupting Candice and Oluchi. I just saw a question in the chat box and another one which is raised, which I thought maybe we can address before we, we maybe go on. Uh, are you okay with that? Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. So, right, controlling and guarding antibiotics. So one of our mentors actually said, um, we were chatting one day and he said that people see stewardship as policing of antimicrobials. And that is not really what it is. So he doesn't want people to think that stewardship is something to do with, um, I don't know. It's about antibiotic control. You also try to control how it's used and you try to guard it so it's used judiciously. But then part of this is also about trying to get people to modify their behaviors. So if you try to control antimicrobial use, for instance, say you want to say um, you don't use this particular antibiotic unless the patient has sepsis. Well, the doctor can take that the patient has sepsis based on what the doctor understands sepsis to be because they want to use that particular antibiotic or that particular antimicrobial. 
And it's also, if you, so it's not just pharmacists and the doctors who also have a role in stewardship. If we look at low and middle income country settings, we have many places where we have antimicrobials available without a prescription. So patients go to a patent medicine dealer or go to the pharmacy and complain about a particular um, illness, and then they get antimicrobials for that. Now, are they getting the right antimicrobials for it? Have they been counseled properly on how to use the antimicrobials? Do they understand how to use it? Do they just, and I know in some settings also, patients buy a few antibiotics at a time because they cannot afford to buy the full dose. And then they take a few tablets to a few capsules and they think they feel better and then they stop. And so these are all opportunities where we can get patients and other people who are not necessarily doctors and pharmacists in the hospital involved in stewardship. So there is a big gap there, especially in low and middle income countries. There is room for stewardship in the community so that the community pharmacists can be involved in stewardship. And I'm not sure, I think it's also something we have to think about. There are many places that have pharmacy or medicine stores, not run by pharmacists, but by patent medicine dealers. And these people might not have any um, training in pharmacy, but might have some kind of apprenticeship training. And so we talk stewardship and we talk about it in hospital, but we have so much resistance being developed outside of hospital setting because people can access antibiotics very, very freely in those environments. And that's not to say that um, that is not, it's a challenge as, um, also, but then trying to make all antibiotics available with a prescription might also not, we're not sure what the solution is. That's what you're still working on. But in some middle, low and middle income countries, lack of access to antibiotics kills more people than antimicrobial resistance. So then it doesn't make sense to police antimicrobials and say people cannot get it because it's a life-saving um, treatment for many people and they might not be able to afford to go to a doctor. So it's quite some, it's quite a dicey and tricky situation to find a balance between access and control. And it's also something that stewardship is working to address. And so I'm glad you brought this question up because we're also trying to get away from the mindset that stewardship is not something for doctors and pharmacists alone in the hospital setting. I don't know if that answers your question, um, Gisrael. Yes, please, Adan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank right. you. Uh, we have another question from right. Zachary. Zachary, you can maybe can I, Zachary, you can go ahead. Okay, um, thank you very much, Ma. Thank you very much for answering that question. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I, the, the answer we give um, partly answered the question I have before, but I understand as my co-resistance, uh, as my stewardship as um, any measure taken to kind of um, promote the judicious usage of um, antimicrobials, right? So um, I feel um, before you do this, you must have integral knowledge, like you must know about these um, antimicrobials before you kind of um, get involved in stewardship. Now my, now my question is, um, do you feel people that have low knowledge about antimicrobial um, resistance or antimicrobials can also be involved in stewardship? Maybe someone that just know that, okay, if you keep um, taking these drugs, um, they might get resistance and you might um, put us all at the losing end. Maybe that's just the only knowledge that the person knows about um, antimicrobial resistance, not actually knowing the full details of um, antimicrobial resistance and the like. So um, individuals like that, can they also be um, involved in stewardship because um, they really don't know much about um, antimicrobial resistance or antimicrobials likes, but they feel they have, um, they, they see the problem and they want to be involved in, in, in helping to tackle the, the, the problem, something like that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. So for stewardship, um, we, have the, we have the definition, which is the judicious use of antimicrobials. Now, under that definition, we can look at different stakeholders then and different people who are involved in stewardship. If we only have those who are knowledgeable involved in stewardship, it doesn't allow us then to engage with other people. That is not to say that anybody can then just come and get involved in stewardship and make decisions about it. This is then where we have um, education coming in. This is where healthcare workers and researchers and other people who are in positions of government or in ministries will now work on this. It doesn't even have to be like done in the hospital. It can be through the media, it can be through various channels, but we need to start reaching out and telling patients more about resistant infections, telling the public more about resistant infections. With COVID, we all saw the news. People were glued to their TVs and their screens and everything and trying to learn more about the virus 
and how to address infections and how to, you know, and how to get infections controlled. And so with COVID, it was more in the face and everyone saw it. Now, antimicrobial resistance is developing and becoming worse and worse, and people are not aware of it. And so if we have a dashboard like we have for COVID for antimicrobial resistant infections, people might start paying more attention. But then what does it take to put such a dashboard up in place? Because we have to have different people involved. Your, your lay patient or the lay person um, um, member of the public might not know a lot about antimicrobials. But then that's why we have tailored education also. So we explain these um, concepts to different people based on their understanding. And they have to understand. So I used to, I used to, um, I learned something from somebody who used to lecture me that if you explain something to somebody and they haven't understood it, it's not necessarily because they, well, the, the knowledge and foundational knowledge of that might be poor, but it might also be because we haven't explained it properly. And so there is room for us to engage with the patient. They don't have to come into the hospital and tell the doctor, no, I'm not going to take that antimicrobial. No, I'm not going to do this. No, this is not right. But we can engage them. We can engage with them. We can teach them more about antimicrobials. We can give the basic knowledge that some patients do not actually have. So they know that when they take antimicrobials like this, they are exposing themselves to so, so, and so. And when they take it like this, it's meant to work better and expose them to less chance of resistance. And they don't need to be, they don't need to be hospital staff or to have a knowledge of pharmacology or medical terms and all that to be involved. They are the ones taking the antimicrobials. So this should be part of the normal counseling that they get when they go to the pharmacy or the patient medicine store. But we also know that there is a shortage of pharmacists and, and pharmacists everywhere. And so it's not also easy for the pharmacists then to engage with all the patients, especially if stewardship is in the community and is not part of the pharmacy's normal duties. And it's possible the pharmacist is reporting to somebody who has to tell she or he or she has to report how many patients I saw today, how many prescriptions I, I, I um, evaluated and all that. And a lot of it comes to the financial side of what was made in the pharmacy. And so such a pharmacist will take out time to educate the patient, but might not have the full time to do that for each patient at each time. And so if, even if you do that, you only catch the ones who come into the pharmacy. You don't catch the ones who have medicines at home that they use, you know, um, not appropriately in other means, you know, by other means. So there is room to have, involve other people. It doesn't mean that they have to come into the hospital and start working with the doctors and the nurses and everyone. But if there's a patient in the pathway and that patient has family members or people who care for them, they should know about the medication the patient is taking and the potential it has to cause antimicrobial resistance and how they must take it properly. And some patients still get these instructions and still take it the way they want to. There's nothing we can do about it, or there's little we can do about it. But it's also up to us as people who are promoting health to educate the patient at all times about antimicrobial stewardship. And so when we talk about other stakeholders who are meant to be involved, it's these people. It's also with education that we make all these opportunities to tell them more about stewardship. Not that they must come into the hospital and get an office where they have to, you know, liaise with and discuss with um, stewardship teams on decisions in the hospital. Is it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Does that answer your question? Um, okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. It does. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank yeah. you. So back uh, to maybe the... Before yes. we go back, sorry, uh, I just wanted to also ask a question um, mm -hmm. in that line, because uh, now you've touched uh, more on, uh, you know, the multidisciplinary aspect, and I think it's really coming out very clear. I just said, well, it's good. I was thinking maybe you can also uh, expand a bit on the concept of also diagnost diagnostic stewardship and how it also brings in the multidisciplinary approach uh, where we also need to, you know, uh, bring in microbiologists. And especially uh, speaking from maybe what I've seen, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, maybe in some of the facilities, we don't have the necessary infrastructure, with the necessary reagents to carry out these cultures. We find that uh, in some facilities you have this in place, but then there's that issue of trust, uh, especially between the prescribers and the, and the microbiologists, especially on issues such as the quality of, of, of the cultures and uh, you know, uh, such things. Yeah, so maybe we can touch a bit on this and how this uh, harmonious engagement can then help us in terms of uh, solving such challenges. Thank you. Right, thank you. 
we have, sorry, we have the multidisciplinary team involved in stewardship. This um, is mostly the healthcare workers who have various contributions to make to stewardship. So we have the microbiologists, the doctors, some surgeons in some settings also, the pharmacists, and in some settings like Candice will tell you later, the nurses also. But then we also have the multi-stakeholders. So I don't call them the multidisciplinary team because they're not within the multidisciplinary team in the hospital. I prefer to refer to them as stakeholders also because they've got a stake in stewardship. They might be the patient, they might be the patient's family. So um, I try to make a distinction between the multidisciplinary team and the multi-stakeholders who are meant to be or who can be involved in stewardship. I think because it's still um, something that we're developing, there's still room to do so much more to develop it over time and actually find out what the proper terms are to refer to different people who have different, who may have different roles um, to play in stewardship. So for the diagnostic um, stewardship, um, let me just, let me jump to, um, to this slide that I was going to come to. So let's say in this example, we have a patient who has, um, I'm not sure, just give me any infection, um, maybe a respiratory tract infection, upper or lower respiratory tract infection. Now this patient goes to the doctor or to a pharmacist in a place where they can access antimicrobials for the prescription. They can get a course of antibiotics for treatment. Let's say they get a, um, they get a penicillin, your amox, okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> let, let's, let's say they get an antibiotic for, for their chest infection. And then the doctor says, if you're not feeling better in three to five days, please come back. And three to five days later, they're not feeling better. And they go back to the doctor. The doctor might give the same antibiotic and tell them to take it for a longer period of time. Or the doctor might give, um, okay, let's go with the lower antibiotic, for, with the same antibiotic for a longer duration. And the patient now takes this for like 10 days. And still not feeling better, they go back to the doctor or the pharmacist, who now says, um, oh, sorry, bear in mind, the doctor or the pharmacist didn't, do, didn't uh, send sample for a culture before this was done. And so now they change the antibiotic and give the patient a second antibiotic and say, okay, start on this one. Um, stop this one. You've taken this for 10 days. Um, just start on this one today. And this is for the next um, five days, three days. And the patient takes it and feels maybe a little bit better, but not fully better. And so they go back again. Um, doctor, I still feel a little bit under the weather. I'm feeling a bit better, but I'm not back to my usual self. And the doctor prescribes a third antibiotic, which hopefully they, or the, <laughs> during the first visit, which hopefully then gets uh, rid of the infection. And now the patient starts feeling better and starts recovering and starts getting back to normal self. Now, because we didn't do the, because there were no cultures done initially, we are not sure why if the antimicrobials given the first time did not work because of resistance, but the chances are very, very high. So this patient could have encountered a resistant infection that was not addressed by the first antibiotic and the longer duration of the first antibiotic and the second one. And now during such times, it's, these are opportunities for the doctor then to tell the patient about antimicrobial resistance, about how maybe this didn't work because you might be resistant to social and so. But if the doctor also didn't take cultures and send this to the lab to be um, for, for resistance and susceptibility tests, he might not know this for sure. And then when the patient goes to the pharmacist to get the, med, um, the medicine, the second antibiotic and the third one and the fourth one, does the pharmacist have the time to say, well, this hasn't been working. Um, what did the doctor say about this, uh, the profile of this particular, um, of the microbe causing this infection? Did the doctor tell him about resistant infections or what did the doctor say? Why, did doc why do you think it's not working? So there are opportunities then for the pharmacist also to engage with the patient, to teach the patient about resistant infections. And there are also opportunities for the doctor to do this. And it's quite, um, it's a big challenge in low and middle income countries because diagnostic tests are actually not very cheap to come by. And sometimes the cost of diagnostics is more than the cost of medicines. And so doctors then prefer to prescribe rather than send the patient for an extra test. And then in many settings also, these extra tests are at the expense of the patient. The patient has to pay for the cost of the tests. And so when you look at this and a doctor sizes the patient and checks what is needed and the doctor tries to make a balanced decision. And sometimes that goes up with treatment without doing cultures. And this is now where our research in social science also comes in, where we try to look at behaviors that influence prescribing and how those 
decisions about prescribing are made and what the behaviors and the context around that place is. If the doctor knows the patient cannot pay for, for, for the cost of a culture, they might not want to send samples for culture, even if they think it's necessary, because the extra cost might not be borne by the patient. And the patient might also not feel there's a need for it. Doctor, just give me my medication. I want to go and get better. And they don't, they don't understand why there is a need for that. And so these are opportunities for the doctor to engage with them in diagnostic stewardship, not as, um, not as colleagues, but to also explain this to the patient using layman's terms or whatever terms it is that is conducive for the patient to understand. And so I think if we do this over time, we can get one patient at a time. It's going to be quite taxing. <laughs> and I don't know how many patients you're going to get involved in stewardship or are going to expose to stewardship like this. But these are opportunities also that we can utilize. And a lot of it has to do with resources. If the resources are available, we'll do cultures for everyone, but they are not. And then we have prescribers having to make decisions. And a lot of these decisions then influence their prescribing behavior which is also influenced by the context or the resources they have available to them, wherever they are. Sorry for talking too long. <laughs> I don't know if that has answered. Sorry, you want to? No, no, no. No, I don't want to. I'm just wondering, Zachariah, do you have another question there? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Can I? Yes, go for it. OK, thank you very much. I think um, the, 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 the major goal of um, embarking on as microbial um, stewardship is to prevent antimicrobial resistance, right? And I'm sure um, one of the major reasons why we're having um, antimicrobial resistance is that people do not um, go for laboratory investigations. Like if laboratory investigations are being done, the chances of you getting um, resistance can be minimized, something like that. So do you feel like um, 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 antimicrobial stewardship should be promoted alongside with um, going for laboratory um, investigations, like making laboratory investigation affordable and accessible, like this should be something that, that goes hand in hand as well as stewardship and promote, promotion of um, laboratory investigation, accessible and affordable laboratory investigation so as to, to prevent um, antimicrobial resistance, something like that. Do, do you feel what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? I think, I think that would be a win-win. Um, I think that would be a win-win, Zakaria. If there is a way to make diagnostic um, diagnostic tests affordable, such that doctors can do that, even when they even if they take cultures and then prescribe something, but then get the result of the culture, which enables them to change their treatment over time. If that is something that is affordable that patients can then access, I think it will help be very very helpful for stewardship. It also depends a lot also on who's taking the sample. Also, there, there are also other contextualities we have to look at. It depends on who's taking the sample. And how well um, and how um, clean or proper such samples are. So I know in some settings, it's not only doctors who take the samples. Patients can present to a lab and say they want to do a test, and then samples are taken by different people in the lab, depending on what their um, what their job description is. And then this is a sample that is then presented for tests. And I've also heard it from some patients who took who had samples taken, but the samples were not um, properly they said the sample had a problem and it was not properly read and they had to go back for other samples. So if there's a way to make this accessible and affordable to go hand in hand with stewardship, it's going to be a win-win because it's very likely you're going to get the right um, antibiotic prescribed the right time, the first time. And even if it's not, once the test result comes back, doctor has the chance or the doctor or the healthcare provider has the chance then to review antibiotic prescribed for the one that is more susceptible. For the one that the infection is more susceptible to. It is a win-win, in my opinion. I'm, I'm not sure if what anyone else thinks, but please. Okay, yeah. Zakaria? Yeah, yeah. I the question is I thank you very much for answering the question. I, I just want to hear your opinion on how to make um how do you think um oh. those um tests could be made affordable and accessible so that like patient can go for those tests and in long run it will prevent antimicrobial resistance and promote antimicrobial stewardship, something like that. Again, like right. in your own um, opinion, how do you feel those investigations will be um, made accessible and affordable to promote antimicrobial stewardship, something like so, that, yeah. That is what we're still working on. Part of our current research is investigating diagnostics used for stewardship to know 
what we can do to make them more accessible and more relevant to uh, not not just accessible but also easy available. to easily available for clinicians to access for patient care so we're still working on that candice is also involved in that study and we hope to have the results soon but it is it's not something i think a lot of it also has to do with um with the finances of the of the companies that are responsible for providing diagnostics with the government and what they have available for health expenditure. But I think there is room to make a case for making diagnostics more accessible and more affordable for improving antimicrobial stewardship outcomes. How we're going to do that and how, how long the process will take and what and what is involved is still what you are researching on. And hopefully we'll have some answers very soon. But if we can get that done, it will be a win-win for everyone. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right, so I'll, 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 spoke in a, I'll hand over now to Candice, please, to tell us a bit more about nurses and how we can engage them in stewardship. So, Daniel, I just want to check in with you. I see it's like five to seven. Um, how much longer do we still have? Um, so I can see time has really moved, but it has really been an interesting session. So I'll just want to hear from you and maybe how long, uh, maybe do you have, we can maybe extend it some minutes around, uh, maybe 15, it's okay on your end. Maybe if we, if we just, we'll do a little bit more and then, um, I mean, not try and fill all the time because I'm sure it'll be nice to just take some more questions because as you said, I think it's, it's more um, helpful to be able to, um, to discuss things rather than us just kind of presenting and, you know, um, everything coming from the one side. So we're just going to talk a little bit more about the multidisciplinary role um, of, of the multidisciplinary team in AMR. And I'm really interested to know because I can't see whether there are any nurses um, in the audience. Because um, it's it's interesting, before I started the Aspires project, I didn't fully understand, even come, even being a nurse, the importance of the role of the nurse in, in stewardship. Um, so, I don't know, can you see, Uluji? I don't see. Um, I've checked the charts. I don't see anyone who identified as a nurse yeah. um, in the chat box. Okay, all right. Okay, but let me just um, really just go on to say that that you would have heard from the, the the Graham report recently that AMR really is one of the ten global health threats facing humanity, um, and that is currently the leading cause of death. And so, one of these strategies is a lot around what we've been talking about is preserving antimicrobials. But infection prevention and control is just as important. And so recently the WHO was um, did a whole webinar series on helping countries to implement national action plans. And there was a webinar that was kind of related to this on the nurses role in stewardship. And here they made a key point. This was the, the, the head of the um, WHO nursing officer said that every infection prevented is one that needs no treatment. And I really want you to think about that. You know, So we, we've been talking a lot about how we are treating infections and needing the antimicrobials and diagnostic tests and all of those really important things. But the nurse workforce and other um, members from the multidisciplinary team have a, have a key role in preventing infection, especially of patients that are in hospital and I guess in the community as well. And so the, the strength and effect of stewardship um, can only fully be leveraged with, with a whole multidisciplinary team um, like sticking together and, and, and knowing their particular roles in stewardship. And it's really interesting because I don't know in, in your context, but in our context, nurses do make up the largest group of the healthcare workforce. Um, they have a key role with the patients constantly, and it's a contact um, position with the patients, and yet they, their role is under-acknowledged in, in stewardship. So quickly, if we look at, at all of what's written around this um, group, these are nurses' roles that nurses are trained to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and a lot of them actually comprise of stewardship and IPC. But the interesting thing is, is that, that nurses, as well as other healthcare workers, there's a real dissonance in the way that they see their day-to-day -day work and the way that they think about those implications, for example, of infection management on on antimicrobial resistance and on the bigger picture. 
So it's just interesting to know why nurses' roles have not been leveraged in, in stewardship. And I'm just going to turn to quickly um, a, a, um, a paper that recently came out that was published by nurse authors in, in South Africa. And really what they were trying to see was whether stewardship guidelines and policies included recommendations for the bedside nurse in stewardship. And of course, as you can imagine, um, they, they don't, that was the outcome, and I'm going to get straight to the outcome. But just looking at the study, I'm going to quickly take you through it. Um, they look over a 30 year period of um, published and gray literature. And the first mention of the nurse was in, or the nurse in stewardship guidelines was in 2014. So that's like just under 10 years ago. If we look at the map on the right hand side, we can now see which countries had um, you know, specific recommendations. You can see where the numbers are coming from, but in the blue, those are the teams that actually included the bedside nurse. And, the, and from our continent, um, we can see that, that nurses aren't considered as, as part of the stewardship team. And then the last line really is how many documents describe the, the role of the, the nurse in stewardship. Um, and again, from us, from, from Africa, there was only one document. Um, just want to quickly have a look at this when we look at the the descriptions in the scoping review on, on team composition so almost three quarters of them describe their, their team makeup and i'm sure those would have included doctors and microbiologists and pharmacists but only a third recognize the role of the nurse in in um in stewardship and what's really interesting for me is that a lot of that is focused on nurses who have got specialist roles in stewardship for example your ipc nurses um or or nurses who are on stewardship teams but that totally like um ignores the the massive nursing workforce who are at the patient's bedside so although they have a role um, this role has not been recognized by by the multidisciplinary team um, and here are just a couple of nurses' roles, which I'm not going to go into now just because of time. But it's um, just interesting to kind of spell those out because the nurses' role is not just around stewardship, but there's a key role in monitoring antibiotics, in monitoring um, you know, the, 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 the um, duration of antibiotics on calling and being a part of team decisions on when to de-escalate and escalate therapy. Um, but I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to stop there um, because this slide kind of just looked at some of the challenges that we we are experiencing and one is specifically related to perspective it's how we see it and then also on on training um, but I'm now going to hand over to Luci I don't know do we want to have a look at some we're doing success, success stories I'm just now looking at the time I'm just going to run through briefly um, we have some so stories of antimicrobial stewardship activities, and these have taken place in various settings. Um, we have um, hospital setting scenarios uh, where um, where antimicrobial um, stewardship has led to to improve patient outcomes and even reduce costs of hospitalization and reduce medication costs. I think our screen is freezing. Yes, and reduce medication costs. Yes. <laughs> And so this has also, um, yeah, thank you. This has also um, led to a call to model antibiotics to worship differently using available staff at the bedside of the patient following um, research that was done to show that you don't need sometimes the full um, staff complement that you have in some high income countries to be able to develop and have the gains of stewardship. And we also have some, an example from primary healthcare setting where we have prescriber partner, uh, part, uh, pres uh, pharmacist prescriber partnerships also. And there were also some advantages to this and how antimicrobials to what should could be optimized in such um, a setting. Yeah. And so um, we're just running through that quickly <laughs> for questions. Um, so, so just in terms of looking for success, success stories of nursing, I, I really looked hard on our continent because I was trying to find something from the government um, sector that reported on nurse success in antimicrobial stewardship. And I couldn't find, I couldn't find anything. I found a lot. The reason I'm, I'm telling you that is because I think nursing is really on the cusp where there wasn't a role in stewardship. And then all of a sudden there's this recognition that yes, there, there is a role, but a lot of the the, um, the the papers that are coming out are really around like describing that role and then seeing how people feel about that specific role. So 
it was difficult to find a success story of stewardship, but I believe these stories are coming out. And so if that's in your context, like we need to get published from, from our continent and get some of the, the good stories out. I did, I did manage to pull one out from Canada um, that was just related to nurses initiating discussion on infection management in on ward rounds in, in ICU. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but um, the, the, the nurses, firstly, in our context, are not engaged in, in, um, in our ward rounds um, in ICUs. And what they did in this context was to give the nurses an opportunity to share on the patient's infection status. And these were some of the components that they had, they were trained to include on the ward rounds. And we don't have hard outcomes to what they found in the study, but we can certainly see like how the, the components improved before the intervention and after the intervention, which is extremely encouraging. And this is just on a morning ward round with nurses um, with nurse contribution. And this is just very quickly shows us um, the, the extent of improvement around the various components on um, antimicrobial discussions in the ward round. So I'm just going to end with that, um, but then quickly point you to this free online course through Future Learn. Um, and there you can see what the topics cover on the right hand side, but it's titled Tackling Antimicrobial Resistance, a Social Science Report. And we really would like to a social science approach. We'd love to point you um, towards it. It and just gives a bit more of what we've discussed. Yes, yes. It elaborates on, on what we've been talking about and especially on, on behaviours around some of these, these issues. Um, and then really just a special acknowledgement and thanks to everybody who's made our research possible, um, especially Ismita Sharani. Dr. Ismita was going to present um, tonight, but she's on her way to ICID. She's the lovely lady in the yellow skirt in the middle, um, and she's our mentor and, and our, our project lead. Um, and so, yes, we just want to thank um, everyone here. Daniel, over to you. Wow, 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 wow. It has been a very great session. I think this means that we should invite you for, for some more sessions, uh, as I can see. <laughs> the discussion was really great and, uh, and it was very interactive and I love it. And very wonderful comments too uh, from the chat. Um, so I think um, we'll just take a few questions. I think we, we are still not, uh, I'd set it for uh, uh, from 6 to 7.15 your time. Uh, uh, so we just have a few minutes to take a question. Um, anyone with a question, you can just raise your hand. If you have said something, you can also share in the chat box. Uh, Zakaria, over to you. If, is it another question? Maybe you can go ahead. Um, it's it's more of um, clarification than a question. I had earlier for this day the, the program started proper. I had um, 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 aspire program been mentioned. Aspires program. I would like to know more about that and maybe if there's a way um, um, and people interested in stewardship will um, help form form on the and land and kind of um, see how to um, build their and my program stewardship skills or something like that. So um, if more um, clarification is to be made on that Aspires program, something like that, I have it to be mentioned there. Yeah, so so um, Zachariah, so Aspires, as Uluchi mentioned in the opening, was a, um, was a multi-site project that we were involved in that started in, in 2019. Um, and it was initiated by Dr. Ismita Chirani, who was looking at um, factors that influence the behavioral behaviors of anti antibiotic prescribing and also team dynamics around infection management. Um, this project started in the UK and was a part of her PhD where she, where she looked at surgical and medical specialties. She kind of compared the, the practice um, between those two teams. And she was so interested in her findings and, and in the, um, the influence of the human behavior on team dynamics and infection management that, that the Aspires project was basically born from then. And, and South Africa became a study site as well as, as India. So there were three study sites. Um, I don't know if we can point you to, um, to this site. To, 
to the site. Oh yes. So it's a it's a, it was a big project. It ended earlier this year, and it had different components. So it wasn't just um Esmita who was involved. There were also different people involved in the study, and different packages. And what we basically did was try to start from from macro elements, sorry, from the micro elements and things that influence antimicrobial prescribing, and then go further above and see how these also are uh, implemented or affected in government and wider circles. And so different packages conducted the research, but the aim was all to optimize antimicrobial use. And sometimes data from one package will feed into another for implementation plans or for modern of implementation. So the study has ended, um, but it's also because of the study that we are conducting um, further research because findings from that study is part of what Candice is exploring in her PhD and part of what I'm also doing um, as postdoc research. So if you want to, you can also send us your email or we can pop a link to the Aspires project on the chat box and you can then learn. Brilliant. Yeah, He's thank you, Daniel. Daniel. Yes, Daniel has popped yeah. a link there. Daniel's so there, <laughs> there have been a lot of publications <laughs> from that study and we've been very privileged to learn from a lot of people who have so much influence, you know, who have so much to, to, to give and to teach about antimicrobial stewardship and infection care. Yeah, thank you. I hope Zachary is it's okay. Yeah, so I think I'll share the link and I'll, I'll also try and uh, collect some of the publications that have been done and share them with the team. I, I read through some and it's quite very interesting. So a really interesting um, uh, study that was looking at uh, antimicrobial steward from another dynamic. Uh, so I can see we don't have another question, but people are saying that uh, the session has really been wonderful and uh, they would love more time. And also, yeah, you also have very great energy. I think we should invite you more to, 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 to speak to us in, in these sessions. Yeah. So at this point, I would love to also maybe reiterate a bit about uh, the concept of uh, nurses' involvement in antimicrobial stewardship. And this is something that we've also realized, even from these projects that we try and bring about tertiary level students. Uh, I think it also needs to be ingrained in training because you find that even when we call for applications for people to engage in such uh, AMR programs, you find that there's a lot of tra uh, trajectory towards uh, healthcare students. But when now you also analyze the healthcare students, you find that uh, mostly it's medical students, um, you have pharmacies, microbiologists, medical laboratory sciences, and you find that um, we really don't have many nurses who are, uh, you know, um, applying or who are really interested in engaging in such projects. And um, yeah, so I think it's something that we also need to look at the concept of also training, whether they also feel like, uh, you know, uh, are they trained that they also part of this, because that's something that we have also critically recognized. So yeah, but I think we have some nurses in the house. Maybe they are not able to attend today, uh, but uh, we have some in the in just. But there are not so many if you compare to the other courses, even other um, courses from other maybe the social sciences because uh, the program was really trying to uh, look at you know from a very dynamic approach, having different uh, courses all the way to engineering. Now we have so many people in engineering who are really. Uh, I engage so much about uh, AMR and AMS, and I would I was challenging the, you know, the team that we need to see how courses like architecture. Was I've read some papers on how things like architecture can really contribute a lot in terms of infection, uh, prevention and control. Anyway, um, so there's a question from Benny. Uh, so just a quick one. So how can doctors do to prescribe? The correct drugs when they don't have the opportunity to do bacterial culture. Uh, Benny, was it a okay? Okay, I think maybe Benny was trying just to ask how, uh, what are some of the best practices that we can maybe um, look at, uh, uh, you know, when we don't have, um, you know, diagnostic. Uh, uh, diagnostics in place. What are some of the best practices? Maybe would you like to comment a bit, Candice or Oluchi? Then I think we can uh, wind it off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Benny. 
I think a lot of it also has to do with um, the with surveillance. When doctors know um, the infections that are quite prevalent in their settings and the antimicrobials that treat them effectively, I think that's one point where they can start with. There isn't um, there isn't a substitute for for bacterial cultures that would be like the most acceptable, if not the gold standard for diagnosing infections. But in cases where these are not available, doctors have relied on the surveillance data that they have from their various settings to say what they think, to then prescribe according to what they think the infection is in the patient. And a lot of doctors also um, rely on the experiences, which is on the experiences and the experiences and the things that the people in their team do which is also where our research comes in. So we found out that a lot of prescribing by doctors is actually um, influenced by what other people in their teams do. Mm -hmm. So there is, we have a, there is a case to make for making sure that the doctors who are then the ones in charge teach the people who are in their teams better or teach them stewardship. Because it's, it's what we found in some literature and in some of other studies is that the the younger doctors and the younger medical officers then try to behave or copy the same actions that their colleagues their senior colleagues do even if that's not necessarily what's in the in the guidelines or if that's even not what's in um according to stewardship but it is what is done in this place and this is how it's done and this is how we learned it and so there's a lot to say about the influence of older um clinicians and how they can help us to to actually make stewardship principles more accessible to younger clinicians. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for that uh, uh, elaborate uh, response. So I think at this juncture, I'd just like to uh, thank you once again. I know it's quite, yes, but go ahead. You mention too, sorry, we keep talking about doctors, but these are only for people who can afford doctors. There are also people who cannot afford doctors who will then go to a patent medicine store or a pharmacist for, for a prescription or for an antimicrobial. And so there is room also to talk about engaging people there. But that's also why we mentioned other stakeholders who can be involved in stewardship. So it's, it's very good to talk about the doctors because we kind of hold them, lots of people hold them accountable and say they must do this. But then it's also important to know that apart from the doctors, there are also other people whose actions and inactions might influence to watch it and try to see how we can get all of them on board as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Oluch, for that. Yeah, so I think at this juncture, it was a very great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I'm sure our participants really enjoyed it. And we thank you so much uh, for taking your time to share this with us. And we appreciate your sacrifice. I know it's now quite late on your end, and uh, um, we really appreciate a lot. And also to our participants, thank you so much also for joining in. I think Idris will just copy your question, then we'll share it with our guests via email because uh, uh, that of time. And also, I would love to thank Esmita also in absentia for helping us coordinate. We've had several uh, sessions with Esmita before. And, uh, and she's also a great friend of mine, yeah. So thank you so much, <laughs> everyone. And uh, over to you, Esmita and, or, ah, sorry, Oluchi and uh, Candice for final remarks. Now, Daniel and everybody, we just wanted to thank you so much for having us with you tonight. We've really enjoyed every minute and we'd, yeah, we'd love to join you when, whenever is possible um, because it's just about learning together. Um, and we've just learned so much about being with you tonight. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. And uh, next time, just join together that way. Yeah. You you look very good uh, in one presentation. <laughs> yeah. So thank you and uh, have a wonderful uh, evening. Thank you to thank you our so participants much. and uh, guys. And let's have a wonderful evening. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. 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 Bye.